I come back to my years as students, as students, I need first to explain uh, something about the difference of the German uh, academia at the time. This was still in the aftermath of the uh, big war, World War, where actually most of the students who started studying were substantially older than I was because they were coming from the front, either from captivity and so on. And in that regard, the social climate of the university was totally different. And in specifically for uh, papyrology, the German papyrologist, almost nobody was left. And a little exception was, let's say, Hamburg, Bruno Snell. And Bruno Snell uh, insisted that his students would do some papyrology. And so Merkelbach, in this way, learned papyrologist on literary papyri. When uh, in my second term as a student offered a course in papyrology and came up and wanted to come up with a uh, photographs of a Tortaios papyrus, which he had from Snell. And he also was aware how Snell tried to arrange the fragment so the two fragments which were separate would go together. I was the only student showing up. And Merkelbach relieved, quoted, tres faciunt collegium. At that point, I got so active and made a sort of uh, uh, arrangement with um, two other students. I do all the work which has to be done. You will only need to nick with your head. That's all what is needed. <laughs> and when Merkelbach heard that, he laughed. <laughs> and it went by that rule. <laughs> um, then in the first, first or second meeting, it happened, he gave the papyrus, the two fragments, and how they should be arranged. And I was silent for a few minutes and said, well, how come in that line there are two letters missing and in the next line with the same area there are three letters mi missing and supplemented by Snell. How does that work? Um, that was no big merit on my part. I am the son of a carpenter, so I see distances when I see them. Uh, <laughs> wrote to Snell, Snell stopped his publication and um, congratulated me and um, at that time it 
was decided if I would develop along that line, then I should become a papyrologist. Now, Kroll, Merkelbach was the Privatdozent, Kroll was the Ordinarius, and he had it in his hat, we have to rebuild the German papyrology. And he uh, was able to collect some money and to buy on the international market some uh, pieces of papyri. Among those papyri was uh, the amnesty uh, of, who was it, Philometor, uh, in the second century, which then became my dissertation. And after that, the rest was just, yeah, routine. And then it got sort of crazy, because at that time, uh, we had in Cologne, one of the new papyri was a choir of the psalm commentar of Didymus the Blind, 5th century. <coughs> and uh, it was given to someone called Pater Kehl, who uh, Wrote the, deciphered it and wrote the commentary, actually a very good piece of commentary. And so I worked through, with him through that papyri. And then I went to London and found out that there are other pages of the same thing in the British Museum. And uh, I got access to that. Actually, um, I ended up with a complete transcription of all the parts uh, which are in the uh, London Museum. And that was in many regards uh, really eye-opening. There was a group of young people like myself and some older and Turner and we worked through that papyrus. That was a great experience. That was another experience. During the year when I was in Oxford, half year in Oxford. I ran into you without knowing him on the, on the stairs of a building. And we started talking to each other and then soon we knew who both of us were. Judy went uh, at that time regularly to Oxford uh, and then it was a Merkelbach arranged that Judy came for two half years to Cologne and worked with the students, with me, and with Hagedorn. Hagedorn was originally, as a student, collaborating with me in papyrology. And ha how the luck has it, at that time we had in Cologne also carbonized papyri. Uh, we went to Berlin uh, to um, being taught how they handled that. That became sort of regular 
visits to Berlin, in East Berlin, and it was just so wonderful to learn the people in, the, the, in East Germany uh, who were still trying to work. Uh, and um, Hagedorn and his uh, future wife accompanied me in a very small car and uh, they were sitting in the back seat and singing arias and I was driving through the night. <laughs> I arrived here in January 75. And I should also say the main reason why I accepted the call for Michigan was Yuki. He was such a superb papyrologist. When it came to reading and correcting and the knowledge of the language, there was nobody else who could reach a water. But my main work was again, I, we are just teaching graduate classes in the department. And out of this sort of learning experience, came also the way how I teach or taught papyrology. Namely, practically no introduction. Each student gets a papyrus. And the rule was always the papyrus I had not yet read. And they were then here sitting, working on that, and that were seminars which didn't take two hours, but expanded in all directions. And I went from person to person and tried to help. Sometimes with success, sometimes without success. And you will have found in the collection all sort of notes coming out of such seminars, that was the background. My experience was that the best way to learn papyrology is to decipher papyri for yourself. There's a, when I tell you something to do and give you reading, well, sure, the professor has spoken But nothing is re reached. But if the student has to work himself and to see how the fragments belong together and to see uh, the holes and what can, what must be missing there, this game of guessing. Uh, in my um, view is uh, the greatest experience. Well, it is not an easy question, but, uh, and with that, of course, it's clear I'm talking about the Mani Codex, the Cologne Mani Codex, which uh, I think was a really, uh, very important because it taught us that the Iranian background, which is certainly involved, is later than what we never would have expected. But I also may say another piece totally different. Uh, did have um, influence uh, the Oracle of the Potter, which 
I have edited uh, several times in stages and I found it a fascinating piece because it led us in uh, the spiritual environment of uh, what was going on in the Oracle of the Potos, which is a prophecy uh, of uh, a successful king and only the last time that I was working on it, it finally dawned on me that I no longer can say whether the author was an Egyptian or was a uh, Greek. It plays it. Formerly, the big enemy is Alexandria, the Greek Alexandria. But it seems that the Greek in the countryside were not very distinguishable from the Egyptians at that time. And that was a factum which really think it's very, uh, there is a lesson very important for us that we can no longer divide Egypt into a Coptic and Demotic Egypt and the Greek too, and the one fighting the other. Insofar so Greeks were involved in the Oracle of the Potter, Mind, the big enemy was Alexandria, the Greek Alexandria. So the world was sort of mixed up. This was an end point of cultural development. And so my work on this um, determined in a good way uh, what I thought about Egypt and what I thought about papyrology. And in my age, I had the nice experience that the story was repeated with the Petra papyri. Where at that time we expect an awe that must be very deeply influenced from the Arabic traditions. But the next thing we noticed, the juristic and administrative language was poor Greek poorly the same as what we know from Egypt. Occasionally some other phrase in it, but basically it was the same. So we had to deal with the city which was, we are no, not much Greek, we are living at the time in the 6th century. But where the Greek administrative spirit, including the Greek tax system of the Byzantine state, was fully working. And we saw on the other hand, then people naming their fields and other localities with poor Arabic names. And we had to try to, we got help, of course, but 
Bob Daniel learned quite a bit of uh, Arabic. I myself looked into it and I knew the kitchen Arabic from my, my time in, in Egypt. And so we had at least some inkling. And had we see there again the cultural development in a complexity that do, does not allow simple questions and simple answers. Paparology should not be taken apart in a Greek paparology, demotic paparology, and Coptic paparology. Surely not everybody can, everybody can everything, but everybody has to be a substantial sort of ability to understand what is said by the others. So that is uh, for me that goes into languages, that goes even deeper into um, uh, cu as a cultural issues. You cannot take paparology into single pieces and think you have a world. No, it doesn't work that way. And on the other hand, this paparology itself by history is closely connected with the Greeks and has to do with the cultural development of Greek. It cannot be taken out. It can be added by larger circles of things which finally belong together. So we are in the terrible situation that we must keep the entirety in our mind. Although as an individual, I can only fill part of it, but I must fill that part I am in, in knowledge about the other traditions. Mm -hmm.